almost all of you will have been doing business at a time when it was easy to do business in this region because the market was growing. Um, if you look, I've got some, I've got a diagram in a minute. If you look at GDP growth in this period, it was steady, high, and above the average of the, ex the original 15 EU member states. All right? Of course, the speed and timing vary by country. And if you're, if you're in Bulgaria in, 19, uh, uh, 90, uh, in the late 90s, you have a bit of a currency crisis. But apart from that, it's been pretty good. And what caused the growth? A couple of things. First of all, all of the economies in this region agreed upon the IMF recipe, which Stuart put up on the board for you there, you know, which is macroeconomic liberalization, currency conversion, uh, elimination of capital controls, free trade, and all that kind of good stuff. And generally, there was cautious deregulation and privatization. I mean, you can contrast what happened in Hungary, where it was kind of like, come here, buy whatever you want. Um, we don't really care, because we're in debt to the Slovenians who were very, very careful about what they did with their companies and they slowly privatized and they selectively privatized to foreign companies and selectively privatized to local companies. And then you had the chaos in Russia with the emergence of um, the oligarchs and you know, a slightly more um, stable situation in Czech Republic and Slovakia. Another thing was that, um, of course, everyone was waiting for EU accession. So all, all of the companies in this region were kind of setting themselves up for EU accession either as multinational corporations locating in Central and Eastern Europe because it was cheaper to sell back to um, Western Europe and the companies from this region getting ready for the new competition. So whichever way you look at it, everyone was getting ready for this sort of uh, growth period and, and, and company strategies were aligned uh, on that basis. Uh, Ralph Eisen Research uh, did a study recently that looked at the transition process. Um, so 100 is our index for 1989, and you can see that almost across the board, uh, as business people, you've been lucky. You've been growing into a growing market. Yeah. Why is it easier to sell when you're selling into a growing market? As companies, why is it easier to sell stuff when the market's growing? There's more money in the market, yeah. Why else is it easier? There may be some optimism, although in Central and Eastern Europe, that's always a difficult commodity to come across, of course. Yeah, you can get away with being bad in a growing market. You can do stuff and continue to grow. You, you may not be growing as much as you should be if you're doing a better job, but the fact is, if the market's growing, you've got new customers coming online. So you spend most of your time, rather than focusing on keeping your existing customers, you spend a lot of your time trying to get new customers, which is, you know, which, which in the marketing field, as, as Professor Novak will tell you, uh, makes no sense whatsoever because it actually takes more effort uh, to get a new customer than keep an existing customer. But in a growing market, you don't care about that, right? Uh, your, your job performance is determined by how many more customers you get. Yeah? This, is, this is another one. This includes the Baltic countries. And again, you can see above trend growth, certainly above the EU15 for much of the period. Another factor, of course, is that in a, in a growing market, it's not just on the demand side, on the supply side, you have a similar phenomenon. So your factor markets are relatively loose, and your salaries are relatively low compared to Western Europe and North America. So again, you can, you, you can basically continue to be successful because you're cheap. Right? Um, and cheapness has a certain value for a while, right? Uh, when that market's growing. And of course, what you also had in this region is you had the multinational companies bringing in technology and market-based logics. So, I mean, we, you know, when we started out 20 odd years ago, there were virtually no MBAs in the marketplace, whereas today we've got a lot of MBAs in the market, a lot of programs offering MBA programs. So we've seen a, a significant development in that area. Um, and we've also seen through the privatization process significant restructuring that's taken place. Again, foreign capital, foreign ideas, foreign business practices coming into the region and transforming what we do. And then uh, you know, Stuart, Stuart's area of expertise, we've also seen a rise in real estate prices. <coughs> and it's kind of interesting because if you look at different countries, you see different effects. For example, if you look at the Ukraine or you look at the Baltic countries, we saw incredibly rapid rises in real estate prices. Your average... Uh, mortgage application in Hungary, aside from sort of being strangled to death by useless pieces of paper, 
it takes a hell of a long time to get a mortgage and they'll only lend you a liquidation value. Whereas if you say look at the Ukraine or the, uh, some of the other Baltic countries, they were lending much higher loan to value ratios. So more credit played a role. Second factor was is that uh, the stock of decent real estate in those countries wasn't as high as the stock of decent real estate in, in Hungary. So there was, there was a lot of the old-fashioned, you know, communist panel houses, not very much of this classic sort of uh, architecture we see here in Budapest. And if you look at the growth of consumer debt across the region, it was very significant. Also in hard currency, dollars, uh, euros, and Swiss francs. Does anyone work for OTP Bank? Anyone here from OTP? No? Uh, you know, yen, yen loans, Japanese yen loans, bizarre, really. Um, a, a, a beautiful piece of where financial regulatory authority should step in and stop the banks from, you know, um, screwing around with people. Um, but, again, but again, Chani does run the country, so I guess you're not, the authorities are not going to do anything about that. Um, don't record that. Um, it's too late. You know, it's interesting. The transition process in this region ended about the same time as the crisis hit. Right? I mean, if you think about EU accession as a sort of line in the sand for transition, two years later we have this financial crisis. If you remain in Bulgaria, of course, you join just as the crisis hits. And of course, if you're Slovakia, you're laughing at the Hungarians because you got the euro, and the Hungarians didn't. So when the financial crisis hit, you know, Slovakia was, was to a greater extent, in insulated from the crisis than Hungary was because there's no way that the European Central Bank is going to let a member state disappear financially if they're part of the eurozone. Yeah. But because our economies in this region are so open, we were particularly impacted by this more than, say, other, other countries. Small open economies, high degree of capital flow, lots of hot money flowing in and out of the country uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, of course, as we know, s numerous countries uh, sought after short-term financing facilities <coughs> from the IMF, the World Bank, and the EU, including our very own country, Hungary. I don't know whether you can see this at the back. Uh, you probably can't. Uh, if you look here, you've got your countries, Bulgaria, Czech, Estonia, Hungary, going down the list here. And if you look at their credit rating, you can see Ukraine, triple C plus credit rating with a credit default swap at 38%. All right. That tells you that's a currency that's not worth very much. Uh, in the middle of last year, you could go down the high street in Ukraine and you could get uh, deposit, the local currency deposits, three months site deposits at 47%. Um, that was to stop the sort of uh, the, the collapse of the economy. But you can see uh, Hungary, A, you've got 5.74% on a credit default swap there. So, and if you look at the current account, almost all of these countries have a current account deficit. Uh, how many of you have a degree in economics? Okay, if you have a current account deficit, what has to happen? You put your hand up, sir. What happens if you have, to have, a, if you have a current account deficit? There should be inflation. Uh, well, you can, yeah, you can, you can print some money to uh, pay off the debt. And what, or, or, or what else can you do? Yep. And how do you get a capital account surplus? Right, so you have to have a net inflow of capital from abroad to buy your assets. Yes, it's a little bit like selling your iPhone to pay your phone bill. Because yeah. uh, you've got a finite number of iPhones, and once you sell them, you don't have any more. So that's another reason why, if you think about the transition process and the crisis hitting at the same time, we've hit an intriguingly unique situation. At the end of transition, there's not much left to privatize, because that's the nature of transition. But you inherit a current account deficit, which means you have to find other ways in which to finance your overconsumption, or you consume less. All right? And we're not America, so we can't just keep printing dollars to deal with the problem. Yeah? Uh, this comes from a PricewaterhouseCoopers study, which is looking at forecasted GDP <coughs> falls. Um, darker reds, bigger trouble. Stars mean we went to the IMF looking for help. And if you look at our region, we went looking for help from the IMF in some shape or form. 